time where you help me welcome Pastor Paul. If you got your Bible tonight, would you turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15? Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. We're going to be speaking on a very familiar uh, parable tonight. Probably a parable I've spoke quite often on, but this is the first time I've ever um, come from this angle or this perspective before. Um, I feel God has just opened up and give me a, a different angle for this parable. So, Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and verse 11. And he, Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, by the way, that's the way the world ends up doing it. You end up losing everything. There arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. It's a bad thing when a Jewish boy ends up, the only job he can get is feeding pigs. Huh? By the way, I don't need to tell you what the Jews thought about pigs. Um, it, it was just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the norm, it wasn't um, the way that it was meant to be for a Jewish boy. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, praise the Lord, amen, he said, how many hard servants of my father, fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hard servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in your sight, I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fat calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder brother was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Your brother is come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry. I would not go in. Therefore, came his father out and entreated him. And he answered, saying to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve you. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments. And yet thou never givest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's just pray. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for this precious book, for the truth of this word. And, Lord, we know that it's this book and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that applies this truth to 
to the human heart and changes lives. Lord, like we talked about this morning in church, Lord, we can't change a human being. A human being cannot change themselves. We need divine help. We need outside help. We need your Holy Spirit tonight. Holy Spirit, would you anoint this frail, weak creature? Would you speak to every heart tonight? Lord, to your people, to any backslider here, to any unsaved person here, that we would glean the heart of God tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I've called this message tonight, Two Diverse Responses to Authentic Heartfelt Repentance. Two diverse or two different responses to authentic, heartfelt repentance. As I've said, I've spoken on this passage many times, and I've always tended to concentrate on the prodigal son himself. Um, while I want to look at the prodigal son very briefly tonight in passing, I really want to focus in on the response to his repentance. That's what I believe God has laid upon my heart tonight. I want to look at what happened when he recognized his own foolishness, when he took ownership of his own rebellion, and when he humbled himself and repented. What was the response? The shocking thing is there are actually two responses to the prodigal's heartfelt repentance in this parable. One was unbelievably gracious, the other was cruelly judgmental. Now, let us establish at the beginning of this message, this was no mere superficial religious profession. This is Jesus showing us what repentance really looks like. Now, if you want to know what genuine repentance looks like, this might be a good place to start in Scripture. After all, Jesus Christ actually formulated this parable. Every parable, there was nothing missing in his parables. It's all carefully worded. The characters involved in it, they're all there to show you and me what certain truths look like. Um, he's just not revealing the heart of God, but he's showing us what is pleasing to him. Now, be under no illusion tonight. The prodigal son blew it. He sank to the depths. He brought shame on his father and his family. Amen? Would you agree? He messed up big time. Luke 15, 13 tells us the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into the far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Verse 30 tells us that he wasted his substance and it was devoured by living with harlots. By the way, this is man at his worst. This is man being man. This is man being wicked tonight. By the way, left to your own devices, this is who you are tonight. But before you're too hard tonight, before you write off the prodigal son tonight, recognize this story is describing you and me. The story of the prodigal son is your story tonight. It's my story tonight. Um, we've all messed up. Amen? We've all offended God. Amen? And we've all brought shame on his name. Uh, the prophet Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 53, 6, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one of us, somehow and in some way have wandered from God and we've ended up getting into a dark place. So this is our story tonight. The hymn writer puts it well, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Do you feel that at times, that there's something within you that wants to wander and to go down the wrong road? Um, why is that? We have a flesh, we have an old nature that is constantly pulling us in the wrong direction. Without the Holy Spirit, many of us might not actually be here tonight. Many of us tonight might be dead and gone. If it wasn't for the grace of God. Tonight, 
only for the grace of God, we could be in a lost eternity tonight. Now, that's why the same hymn writer concludes, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. But the lovely thing about the, the prodigal, and I don't want to dwell long upon him tonight, but it says that he came to himself. And he started to think about his father, about his father's home. And he thought, like, how many servants has my father got? They've got not only bread enough bread, but they've got bread to spare. And he says, here's me perishing with hunger. And he says, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hard servants. Now, remember, this is Jesus describing a repentant sinner. He's showing what is acceptable to the Father. Now, I believe tonight we're looking at real humility. We're looking at authentic repentance. And this is what God's response to that is. I want to look at it in a second. And I think sometimes we make salvation, forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation, and A to Z. Um, when it is, in fact, a spiritual response to God. Uh, the prodigal son was so remorseful and broken, he would literally have been happy to be a servant in his father's house. He would have been happy to be a slave. He would have been happy to have a roof over his head. He would have been happy to just have a comfortable bed. He would have been happy with food on the table. What was his father's response going to be to this? After all, he had brought great shame on his father. Now I want you to remember that the father in this story is a picture of God. It should show us how he deals with us when we come to our senses. Okay? So I want you to stick with me tonight and come close. Look how the father responds to this son who messes up. In Luke 15, 20, it says he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. He had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I'm so glad that the father in this story is a picture of God. And that should give you comfort tonight. This is not a God that wants to damn you, but it's a God who wants to rescue you from your self-made hell. It says here that he had compassion. Now this word compassion literally means to be moved. And the, the actual Greek word means to have your bowels yearn. Your bowels are yearning. That is to feel sympathy, to feel pity, to feel compassion. I wonder how do you feel when the prodigal son comes to himself? How do you feel? Do you throw the book at them? Do you throw the law at them? Do you beat them over the head? Or do you treat them the way God treats them? He ran to this son. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. Now this Greek word kissed is a very strong word. It literally means to kiss mouth. To kiss again and again or to kiss tenderly. You can imagine he just falls on him. He's kissing him and kissing him and kissing him. Remember Jesus formulated this parable. Every word that's used in this parable was chosen very carefully by Jesus Christ to represent his father. This is how God responds to his child who rebels against him, who ignores him, who offends him, and who brings shame upon his name, but then humbles himself. Isn't this good news tonight? Talk about love. Talk about undeserving favor. What? You don't think Jesus is trying to make a, send a message out to us tonight about God? He's trying to relay something to us that we can go, wow. 
I've, I've had preachers say to me, I don't preach anymore on the, on the grace of God because there's greasy grace out there. I've had preachers say that. I'm like, what? How can you take grace out of the gospel because it's written on every page of the Bible? This year is the grace of God in operation. This is authentic love. This is authentic compassion. This is authentic forgiveness. I love that old hymn that goes like this. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Uh, I prefer to put the word shed in there, okay? I don't know why a lot of songs, are, they put the word spilt in. Spilt is an accident. Okay, you spilt, you spilt milk on the carpet. Huh? But it was, Calvary wasn't an accident. His blood was shed. But anyway, that's just me. Okay. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, brighter than snow. You may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? What does the Father do then? So he sees him in the distance. He sees him coming back. He sees him getting right. He runs and he, he's just loving on it. What's the next thing that he does? We find it in verse 22. He says, bring forth the best robe. Put a ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. Brother, sister, this is incredible. What are we looking at here? We are looking at what forgiveness really looks like to God. We're looking at a clean slate. We're looking at full reconciliation. We're looking at complete restoration. See, I hear people saying this. I don't know whether you've ever heard this. You know, well, I forgive, but I don't need to be reconciled. I forgive, but I don't need to like restore whatever. Or, I said this a few weeks ago, I heard somebody saying, I can love them, but I don't need to like them. Have you heard that one? Have you ever used that one? <laughs> huh? Pastor McDonald used to say that. I love them, but it doesn't mean I need to like them. The Bible doesn't say I need to like them, but what I'm saying is, you know what it's like. Here's, can you imagine the father in this story saying, well, I love them, but I don't like them? Huh? Is that what he's saying? So, the, the, we've got the best rope in the house. And to me, that denotes the father's apparel. He gave him the best rope in the house. He covered him with his own garment. Is that not what happened to us in salvation? Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My, my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So he gives him the best robe in the house. He then gives him a ring, puts a ring on his finger. The father's ring is a picture of position. It signifies authority in ancient times. Do you remember the story of Pharaoh? When Pharaoh appointed Joseph, over Egypt, one of the things that he did was he put a ring on his finger, signifying he's the man. He's my right-hand man. He's the prime minister of Egypt now. Um, the same thing happened in the book of Esther. Um, the king took off his ring and he gave it to Mordecai. What he was doing is he was putting his blessing and saying that he's my man. The father also put shoes on his feet. Um, in ancient times, servants and slaves 
we're barefooted. But sons wore footwear. So obviously, whatever state the prodigal son got into, he didn't even have shoes on his feet. Or it doesn't say that he replaced his shoes. It says that he put shoes on his feet. That tells me he ended up being a slave. A slave to that world out there. And after all, he was eaten with the hogs. So obviously, he, he, would just, he had nothing. He had nothing. Jesus shows here that true forgiveness involves restoration to the privileges forfeited by sin. His position as son was completely restored. Isn't God good? Isn't he more gracious than we could ever imagine? What is biblical forgiveness? The word forgiveness literally means to pardon. Forgiveness is essentially the act of pardoning an offender. It literally means to let go. Um, it's a bit like whenever you have a debt to pay. And suddenly you're absolved of that debt. Basically that debt's gone. The slate's clean. Forgiveness in the Bible denotes a release or a dismissal. In repentance, when you turn from your sin, your past is dismissed. God removes your past. It's gone. That's what it means to be forgiven. Can you see the grace of God here in this story? He gives you what you do not deserve, not what you deserve. God gives his children the power to do the same. Now, I want you to come close here. You give others what he has given you. What do you give other people? Now, please see here, it was on the grounds of repentance. On the grounds of repentance, there was forgiveness, there was restoration, there was reconciliation. On the grounds of repentance. True forgiveness is an act of grace. True forgiveness occurs on the grounds of authentic repentance. The reality is it doesn't matter what your definition of forgiveness is. It doesn't matter what Google's definition of repentance is or forgiveness. It doesn't matter how the government defines forgiveness. It matters only how God defines forgiveness. I'm going to say that once more. It doesn't matter what your definition of forgiveness is. It doesn't matter what Google's definition of forgiveness is. It doesn't matter how the government defines forgiveness. It matters only how God defines forgiveness. In this story tonight, you are getting God's definition of forgiveness. You will never understand the nature of God's gracious forgiveness until you understand the nature of his love towards you. You will never experience God's gracious forgiveness until you humble yourself and travel down the road of repentance. The troubling part of this parable is this. There was another response in this story. What about the elder, legalistic, religious brother? It says in verse 25, Now his elder brother was in the field. And as he came out and drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, What's going on? The servant said unto him, Your brother's come, and your father's killed the fatty calf, because he's received him safe and sound. Was the elder brother happy? Was he happy his wayward brother had returned? Pat, did he give him a warm welcome or a loving embrace? Was he kissing him? Mm, it's so good to see you. Was he? Was he relieved that the family was now reunited? I'm afraid not. Quite the opposite. It says in verse 28, he was angry. And he wouldn't go in. 
to his father, come out and talk to him. And he answered his father, he says, Lo, in these many years I served you, and neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Guess what you're looking at here? You're looking at a religious brother. Huh? I've never done anything wrong. Huh? Please remember what we're looking at here. We're looking at the father. We're looking at... He's saying this to his father. But this guy, look at him. He's devoured your living with harlots. And now look what you're doing. You're welcoming him in. Huh? His brother was enraged. The Greek word here interpreted angry literally means provoked, enraged, exasperated, and wroth. Wroth's an old English word. He was wroth. His bud, blood was boiling. Like he's, he's hearing the music up at the house there, and he's out in the fields. He's angry. He's agitated. The elder brother wanted the prodigal son to suffer for his sins. He wanted him punished for his wrong. He wanted justice for him. By the way, this is the way religion thinks. This is the way religion thinks, dead religion. There's no concept of grace, mercy, love, forgiveness, or restoration. No, nothing but cold, callous, cruel justice. He doesn't deserve this. This is what he deserves. Aren't you glad in this story that this guy does not represent the true God of heaven? Aren't you glad this is not the guy you're going to stand in front of someday? If you were, guess what? How would you want to stand if this was God? How would you want to stand in front of this God? If you were, if I was here tonight telling you this is the God of the Bible, how would you feel tonight? I would be honestly, I would be out of it. I'm like, I, I just can't, I can't live up to perfection. There'd be no hope for any of us tonight. Let me tell you something that the Bible shows about the legalists. They do not have the capacity to biblically forgive. They definitely do not forget. They hold everybody else by the law, but they expect the grace, the mercy, and the love of God in their own life. This is totally hypocrisy. Remember, you can only give others what you possess yourself. If you have the grace of God in your heart, you can give grace to others. But if you have that ruthless, judgmental spirit from a ruthless, judgmental God, then that's what you're going to be. The major problem with the religious is that they're experts at identifying your faults and failings, but totally blind to their own hypocrisy. This is the ultimate pride that damns the religious. If they would simply see the putridness of their own heart and the toxicity of their own thoughts, they might immediately fall to their knees and repent. I'm going to say something tonight. When you see yourself for who you are, it should produce a humility in you. When you see how deceptive your heart is and how deceptive your thoughts are, it should cause you to be slow to write other people off. Amen? You see, if you can put yourself in a high chair and just write people off, there's something wrong with your experience. But the reason why we can give grace to others is because we have received grace upon grace upon grace. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Think about his history. Imagine Paul the Apostle coming up. He didn't just go and ruin all his, blow all his money on prostitutes. 
you know what Paul the Apostle was doing? He was wasting the church. Destroying Christians. Everywhere Paul went, destroying Christians. You know what liberated Paul? Knowing that God was a gracious God. What liberated him knew that he didn't have a past anymore. That God truly wiped the state clean with him. What I've found with religious people is this. They do not say sorry. They do not repent. They do not forgive. What's the problem? Pride. Unforgiveness is the fruit of pride. Unforgiveness is essentially a mixture of pride, hurt, and bitterness. They think they're okay. They think that they're better than the rest of us. The elder brother might not have left the father's house and sunk to the outward depths, but inwardly his heart was bitter. He was full of all types of bitterness and jealousy, unforgiveness, and malice. I want to say this. Satan loves a Pharisee more than he loves a drunk or a pervert or a thief. That's because the Pharisee gives the perception of God. A false perception of God. Remember this, the devil ultimately wants to misrepresent God and stop people coming to the God of this book. So if he's able to misrepresent God, then he's able to push people away from God. But the Holy Spirit is here to present the true God of this book. By the way, which type of God do you have tonight? Is your God the gracious God, the true God of the Bible, or is your, is your God this prideful, ruthless God that's ready to just to write people off and refuse people the path of forgiveness. That religious spirit is nothing new. It has been around since the book of Genesis. It hasn't changed over the centuries. It doesn't want to resolve anything. It, do, it wants to punish the wrongdoer. Who was the first apostate in the Bible? Who was the first wicked man? Cain. The first child of the devil. Amen? I know you, people could argue that Adam was a child of the devil, but he was a child of God. Amen? But the first apostate in the Bible, the first man to, to, to go to hell was Cain. How did he deal with his brother, his righteous brother Abel? Why? Why did he do that? Both of these guys were religious. Think about this. They both would come to the altar with the offering. Amen? They didn't bring that offering to the devil. They brought that offering to Jehovah God. The God of the Bible. Yahweh. But when someone has that bitter spirit, it's a murderous, it's a judgmental, ruthless, murderous, vengeful spirit. It'll write you off in a heartbeat. See, as you compare the true faith in Scripture to that which is mere outward and superficial, you'll notice that there are stark differences. Dead religion is mean. It's heartless. It's cruel. It's hard-hearted. It's vindictive. It's unforgiven. It's cold-blooded. It's murderous. I don't want anything to do with that, by the way. How about you? Are you attracted to that? Are you comfortable around that? The proud fail to grasp the solemn warning of Jesus in Matthew 7, verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet out, it should be measured to you. Now, I'm here to tell you tonight, don't go to hell with your bitterness and blame God. 
Don't do that. This is your chance to get delivered of this bondage. It's your chance to be free. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Brother, sister, this is where the rubber meets the road tonight. There is nothing that represents God more than forgiveness. That's who He is. That's why He come to this earth. Because He desires to forgive men, to restore men, to reconcile men to Himself. Anything apart from that is just a misrepresentation of God. Did Jesus not say in Matthew 10, 8, freely you've received, freely give. That's why I keep saying you can only give others what you have yourself. If your heart is full of the grace of God, you can give that to others. I think sometimes you say, well, if I only forgive my brother Cameron, that's going to he's going to let him off the hook. He's going to think he's okay in what he did. But if he repents, he's free. And you're free as well. That's why I always prefer to side on the side of grace, love, and mercy. I would rather people accuse me of being too gracious. Because I know what my flesh is like. My flesh would just write somebody off in a heartbeat. I, for 15 years, I was trained as a police officer to find fault. They trained you. You're going out there. You get into that car. You're looking for somebody who's who's driving the car a little bit wobbly. You're looking for somebody's tire that's balding. You're looking for somebody that's staggering about there. Or you're looking for faults. You're trained to be a fault finder. And I find myself not just on duty being a fault finder. Whenever I was off duty, I'm like, I'm always looking for faults. Like Cameron and Tom, I need to watch that guy. He's, there's something about him. No, but I'm telling you, so when I came back to the Lord, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be like that. Because that's the opposite to you, who you are. I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. I want that whenever they say sorry, to be able to say, I accept that. I, I give them the benefit of the doubt. Do you understand the, the whole thing about true forgiveness is on the grounds of repentance? There's people out there that are happy in their sin and they want to destroy you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who came to himself. This guy, this is true repentance. And how does the religious deal with him? No. So as I close, for those that know the truth, And then they don't function in the truth. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 15. It shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than for you. Who know the truth, but you refuse to go in the truth. He says it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. How did it end up for Sodom and Gomorrah? Total destruction. But on Judgment Day, it's going to be more tolerable. They're going to, their hell is going to be less than your hell. Because I heard a preacher preach a sermon, Sodom had no Bible. Even Lot was compromised. He didn't preach the gospel to them. There's no record of Lot preaching the gospel. Maybe he shared it with his own family. But he ended up, he'd come out with two of his daughters. He lost his own wife. According to this parable, forgiveness involves restoration. Are you willing to do that to others? Don't expect to receive that from God unless you're willing to extend that to others. Let us pray.